Okay, I've been asked to talk about the toxicology uh, and the lessons we've learned from shuttle. Uh, my own experience has gone from about 1989 to the present, uh, 2010. I've divided this into four segments. The first segment is gonna deal with dust in the space vehicle and how we've managed that and learned about it uh, over the decades or so that we've studied it. The next segment will be archival samplers, that is, methods that we have used and developed to sample the air uh, during a flight, bring back the samples, and analyze them after uh, the mission is over. This has clear limitations if you're trying to diagnose and, and troubleshoot a problem. Uh, to get data that are three or four months old is just uh, not very useful. Then I'll go on to talk about real-time onboard analyzers that give us a lot of capability in terms of monitoring for combustion products and uh, some of the, the lead-in to being able to monitor volatile organics on the station where we've developed a lot of the techniques and proven them on the shuttle. And then finally, I'll pick up some bits and pieces that don't have anything to do with hardware but have to do with other lessons we've learned about setting limits and dealing with ground-based issues that pertain to toxicology and so on. So let me start off with dust. If you were to take a sample of dust from shuttle, from the vacuum cleaner, it would look something like this. You see in here a lot of fiber particles. Uh, there are clearly some food particles. If you were to look closer, there would be a few metal shavings and so on. And this particular sample uh, was taken in order to determine if rat food bar pellets or pieces were getting out into the cabin. This was during an experiment when there was a rat habitat on board. And we we're actually able to discern a few particles that looked like rat food and pull them out from the mess I just showed you. But to look like a rat food bar is not enough. And what we did was use GC mass spec pyrolysis to identify a spectrum for these particles and for rat uh, food bar material that we knew about. And we were able to identify uh, with high confidence that in fact the pellets from the rat food bar were getting out. Uh, that was no big deal because there weren't that many pellets actually. There was a concern early on in the 80s about the particles in the shuttle and particularly uh, having to do with the respirable particles, which are those that are less than five microns. Um, ben Liu and some other experts at the University of Minnesota and some monitors here at JSC uh, got a flight together and there were two instruments on that flight. One was a cascade impactor, which would partition the particles according to their size and another one was to measure the raw concentrations. This is the instrument that was used to measure the raw concentrations and follow them over time. Uh, the experiment was very successful from the very beginning and gave us two good reassurances about dust particles. First of all, the concentration in the air was not so high that it would be a threat to crew health. And in addition, the concentration in the respirable size was well below any standards we would set for uh, the shuttle. Eventually, uh, the large floating particles uh, became a nuisance to the crew. And so in the mid to late 90s, something called the Orbiter Cabin Air Cleaner was developed. This was a large unit that fit in the opening between the mid deck and, and the flight deck. It had the advantage that, yes, indeed, it cleaned out the uh, large particles, but it was noisy and the crew didn't always uh, welcome its presence. But it did get rid of the dust such as it was. Now I want to go on and talk a little bit about archival samplers. Uh, these are samplers that are used on orbit by the crew and we bring back samples and analyze them on orbit. In 1985, the toxicology group patented this device which we call the solid sorbent air sampler. This was to enable the crew to take up to seven samples during a mission. And they had to turn this dial to select which uh, sampler they wanted to load the air sample onto and then eight was a parking position they couldn't use that for a sample the way this thing functioned was this there was a holder for batteries right here uh, two b-size cells there was a pump here something like what you might have in an aquarium and there were tiny tubings that would run the gas around and deposit the uh, contaminants 
in these long tubes that were filled with a sorbent material. This device was brought back into the lab and hot air was run through these tubes to desorb the pollutants and they were uh, put into a GC mass spectrometer. Problems with this were primarily concerning the pump. We measured the flow before and after flight and oftentimes the flows didn't match very well. Uh, we for a while thought that maybe that was due to obstruction getting into these tubes when we drew air in, but we had a very good filter over the end of it. And eventually we concluded that the way we were actually doing the measurements in the lab was not sufficiently consistent. And so we worked that over and got this to go very well. We did fly this for a number of times on the shuttle Mir program. One adaptation we made for Mir was that there were a lot of floating dust particles in Mir. And what also would later appear to us to be liquids and food and so on. And often the inlet would get plugged up on Mir. And so what we devised was actually an inlet with five ways in. If you look at this, there are the four ways around and then the one on the end. This gave us four more ways for air to get into the uh, inlet as compared to just one of these round holes. And this never failed. We never had a plug up problem after that. Uh, I might point out that this unit's actually a fairly famous unit because it was the one that Dr. Jerry Leninger used after the S-Fog fire. And if you can look very closely on this, he notes where the fire occurred. We'd had two routine samples before the fire. And then he notes here that a fire occurred. And he used it in a very carefully worked out sequence, not like we planned, but very smartly to show that the pollution actually cleared from the air in about a day and a half. So in a certain sense, this is a historic uh, solid sorbent air sampler. That was good. We thought we would build something better. So we built uh, a larger version of this shown in this picture. This had 16 tubes, and they were longer tubes, and we had them set so that we could take them out more carefully and uh, desorb them better than we could in the solid sorbent air sampler. We also had this set up with a programmer so that the whole unit could be programmed to automatically take samples uh, once the unit got on orbit. Turned out it was too large and too cumbersome to actually fly. Uh, tests in the lab indicated it was pretty good, but. Uh, we learned a couple lessons. Uh, one, you can't fly really big things, uh, no matter how much you want. And um, we knew that crew time was important, but uh, this did not have enough gain in terms of not using crew time to actually get it flown. The other th goal of flying things on orbit is to get things smaller. There have been ground-based testing, and a lot of labs had used something we call the archival organic sampler. We flew a, a cluster of these, and the idea with these things is that you would not need the pump. Remember I said the pump in the solid sorbent air sampler was a little bit of a problem. That these would actually capture a sample by diffusion through a very tiny hole that I think probably is difficult to see, but there's a tiny hole right in the middle of this. And the idea is that pollutants would diffuse across this into a trapping resin below it, and then the crew would simply seal it back up and we would get it back in the lab and analyze the pollutants in the resin. Two problems with this. One, they weren't sensitive enough to capture the level of pollutants we would see on shuttle. And two, things like this ring here actually released enough pollutants that it contaminated the trapping resin. And so we tried to use these, but they didn't work. Um, now, one last sorbent effort was conducted after Columbia Shuttle had been one of the main ways we were getting samples down from the station. But when Columbia occurred, the Columbia accident, we had to very quickly get away to bring back samples. Uh, samples had been coming back in this grab sample canister that I'll talk about in a minute. But we needed a much smaller way that we could get back samples on Soyuz. So in a period of about a month or two, we went from concept to ready to fly with something we, we call the archival uh, well, these were just dual sorbent samplers. We called them dual sorbents because of, instead of like this, with one sorbent material, we actually had two sorbents in here. We had a pump that would fly, and these would go back and forth. 
and the crew would pull the ends off of these and aspirate the sample through and then you can see the heat marks here. Once these are brought back, the tubes are heated, the sample is desorbed and analyzed in the lab. This is very much like a single component of the uh, solid sorbent air sample that I showed you the inside of here. We learned a lesson here. We, we really did a crash program to get these on, as I said, in a month or two. And the recoveries from these were very good if the samples were more than about a month old. But oftentimes on station, we wouldn't get samples back until they were three or four months old. And a lot of the volatile organic polar compounds declined rapidly. And uh, we never did figure out where they went. We, we developed correction factors for those pollutants. But because of that, it made the measurements that much more uncertain. And we eventually abandoned this as, as not uh, sufficiently accurate. Now I want to move on to a new kind of sampler. These samplers didn't require uh, a sorbent bed as such to capture the sample. In the 1980s, we were using something we affectionately called the sausage. And this would, uh, we would evacuate the inside of this uh, canister here. And the crew member to get a sample would remove the dust cap most of the time, open this valve, and a sample would be aspirated in here. We learned a few things. One is that the crew members like to unscrew this too far. Hence, we added this little arm so that that's impossible to do. The other problem that we never really solved, because we have to have a dust cap here, is that occasionally the crew member would forget to take the dust cap off. And we could tell very quickly that no sample was acquired, because there are pollutants on orbit that are very characteristic of, of what you ought to see from a spacecraft, such as methane. If you didn't see any methane, it was a bad sample. These have a, a, an OK volume to surface area configuration. But a sphere actually gives you better volume to surface area configuration. And one of the problems with the sausage was um, that we were afraid some of the uh, pollutants were actually here adhering to the walls of the canister. And we couldn't see them. So we uh, started using these uh, round canisters in the 1990s. And you can see again, there, here's the dust cap. This particular version doesn't have the arm to prevent this from coming off. The other issue that this solved was that this, there's a metal-to-metal -metal contact in here. And if any dust does get in here when the sample is acquired, then when the crew member goes to seat this valve back, the dust, piece of dust gets trapped in there. And occasionally, we will lose a sample that way. The other thing is the metal-to-metal -metal valve actually got ruined from time to time because the crew members would over-tighten the shut valve. So now you can see there's a clutch here. And this is very much like your gas camp if you've got a relatively modern car. You can only tighten it so far, and then it clicks, and you're done. These still are in service. We use these on the International Station, and we use these on shuttle now to bring back an end-of-mission sample. We did try for a period of time to heat the walls of these to drive the canister, uh, some of the pollutants that may have gotten on the interior walls. But that brought in a host of other problems. And so we eventually abandoned the idea of heating the walls of these things. Now I want to step back just a second. This is another sorbent method that came along in the 1990s. One of the compounds that sticks to the walls of these things and is very difficult to quantify is formaldehyde. But formaldehyde is an important component of off-gassing and is also uh, released in a, some of the curing processes that are used for materials on shuttle. So we looked around and found um, formaldehyde badges. Uh, this is very inexpensive. They're $20 even now. And the way these work is the crew member pulls off this tab to start the process. And this bisulfite material in here traps formaldehyde as it passes by in the flow stream. After 24 hours, the crew member covers the badge, and it's brought back for analysis by spectrophotometry in the lab. Problems with these badges are that they are small, and they sometimes get lost. They have found these badges that have been open for uh, weeks or even months, tucked in somewhere in the station. Um, they, we push the limit of detection with these badges also so that we use them in pairs for more accurate readings 
but they still are used on space station. We did use them for a period of time, for example, in the extended duration orbiter program of the shuttle, and we found that formaldehyde was not a problem then on shuttle, at least within the limits that we had set then. We did have an experience with these. We were using these in a lunar Mars life support test on the ground, and a lot of formaldehyde was being released, as it turned out, from some of the acoustic materials and some of the murals that were put in there to keep the crew entertained. Um, and these formaldehyde badges were used, being used and were showing that formaldehyde was increasing, and one of the crew members actually had some level of respiratory irritation. And so the question came up, were these badges really accurate? And we used a gold standard method uh, that's a wet chemistry method, which you could never use in space, to show that, in fact, these badges were giving very accurate readings. And so we trust them a lot. Now I want to move on from uh, samplers to actual analyzers on orbit. We experienced a number of uh, issues that involved small combustion events in the late 1980s and early 1990s. This is a picture from STS-28, which flew in 1989. If you look carefully, uh, what's happened here is that a, a wire junction with a sleeve of Teflon has pyrolyzed. It was actually out in the oh, general space in the shuttle, and the crew was very aware when this happened because it arced, it sparked, it made a little smoke, and it definitely got their attention. This and a few other events, something like this, but l much less, sh uh, much more subtle, uh, impelled us to try to get some uh, real-time onboard analysis of combustion products. Another event that got our attention was when a motor failed in the orbiter refrigerator freezer. This is a picture of that motor. And what happened is that there was no thermal protect on the motor, and the sleeve that this thing was driving that went to the fan seized up against its sleeve, and the motor kept trying to turn the shaft but could not and got hotter and hotter. This is a Delrin case here, and one of the best ways in the world to make formaldehyde is for Delrin to be heated. And so this thing made copious amounts of formaldehyde. You can see where the plastic structure is actually destroyed here and some of the electronics up here were destroyed. Um, this was on STS-40. Uh, it's my judgment that the mission would have been cut short had the crew not had a place to go uh, outside of the module where this event occurred to um, escape the bad smell from this. And I actually had this thing in my lab for a while, uh, and it, it reeked even through the bags that we had containment. Uh, there were a lot of uh, clearly small, noxious compounds that would get through the bag. So anyway, in the early 90s, there was a lot of impetus to get something up there to measure combustion products. Our first attempt at that is shown here. We called it the Combustion Products Analyzer. It did four compounds. It did hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen cyanide, and carbon monoxide. We looked at the products of combustion of the kind of materials that we thought might burn on orbit that would be primarily uh, wire insulation and polymeric materials. And that's how we selected those four compounds. Uh, we were under a lot of pressure to get this on board, uh, and that was okay. In the early 90s, it was very easy to get things funded. I remember going to Clay McCullough, who was then the, the GFE manager for the shuttle, and saying, hey, we've got a problem with this combustion stuff. We've got an analyzer we think we can fly. His question is, how much money do you need? We told him he gave us more than that, and we were flying this thing within a few months. No boards, no mess, no fluff. Go do it. So we flew this. There was a downside, it turned out. We asked, we knew the carbon monoxide sensor on this thing was sensitive to hydrogen. We asked the ECLIS guys, the Environmental Control and Life Support guys, is there any hydrogen in the shuttle? No, there's no hydrogen in there. So it's okay. So we're not going to worry about the hydrogen cross sensitivity. So we flew this baby. And the carbon monoxide sensor, which is an electrochemical sensor like all the others, it gave us a pretty strong reading of carbon monoxide. That gave us some anxiety. And when we got back and looked for hydrogen in this, which we had never looked for before in this canister, we discovered that, yay, verily, there is a lot of hydrogen in the shuttle. 
it accumulates from human metabolism and other processes. So we had to correct the electrochemical sensor in this thing for the hydrogen cross sensitivity. Well, emission was coming up, and we tried to change the bias voltage in the electrochemical sensor, and we thought we had done that. We did a very quick test, and it seemed like it was going to work well. Uh, unfortunately, we picked the first flight of that to be one, I think it was STS-35, where two data display units had a pyrolysis issue. And this instrument gave carbon monoxide readings that were, let's say, in the interesting level. And that caused a lot of anxiety. And we eventually concluded indirectly that it really wasn't carbon monoxide. There wasn't enough of that in the air to set this thing off, and it was hydrogen. But a lot of attention was drawn to this and I would say a lot of negative publicity. Now, if, in case I forget to say it later, one of the things we've learned is if you have an instrument that performs 90% of the time and it fails 10% of the time, they'll remember the 10%. And if you build a subsequent version of it, you want to call it by something else. You do not want to call it CSACP2. Lesson learned, good politics. This instrument did perform very well, incidentally, on Mir. Actually, this is one that flew on Mir, and I know that because it's got all the Russian written on the back here. A year after the solid fuel oxygen generator fire that I told you about in connection with this device, there was a much smaller fire that involved the trace contaminant control system on, on Mir. Basically, a filter that had a cellulose plate in it was moved into a hot stream prematurely and the cellulose plate burned. This caused a little bit of smoke in the cabin, but nobody thought much about it. The crew seemed to be fine, but later that evening and the next morning, uh, crew members complained of headache and nausea, and those symptoms are consistent with carbon monoxide poisoning. And it turned out readings with this instrument that was still being flown as an experimental instrument showed carbon monoxide levels uh, about 500 ppm. And we later confirmed that the readings of this thing were accurate because one of these things was taken during the period of time when the carbon monoxide was up. So we learned that this instrument really can, with appropriate hydrogen correction, give us really good readings. The lesson there was not only instrumental, that is, be careful what you fly, make sure it's as ready as it can be. And if it's an experiment, make sure everybody knows it's an experiment and not ready to go hardware. There was a lesson there, though. The solid fuel oxygen generator fire that was associated with this was an in-your-face 4th of July type fire. It was an obvious fire. There was clearly an immediate threat to the entire Mir spacecraft. The trace contaminant control fire was a much smaller event, and we didn't think much of it. But toxicologically, it was much more serious. If the carbon monoxide levels had been twice what they were on Mir, it could have been lethal to the crew. That's how high the, the carbon monoxide levels were. Uh, as we flew this over the years, we learned one more lesson I'm reminded of here, this piece of tape, which is not a very sophisticated solution, but worked. Sometimes on, as this machine was shipped, it seemed that people would either play with this or the switch would get moved. And so by the time the crew got it on orbit, it was on and the battery was dead. So this rather inelegant, but effective solution was to put a piece of tape over it. Simple, cheap, makes you change the drawing. That's about it. All right, so those were the early days of combustion products monitoring. In between there, there was fear of moving contaminants that were outside the vehicle into the vehicle. Uh, this was particularly on space station, but also applied to shuttle. Uh, we flew to monitor propellants, particularly hydrazines, a derivative of a chemical agent monitor used by the military. This is like a large flashlight. This is a handle that the human is meant to um, hold here. And the idea was to use this to scan the EVA suit when a crew member came in if there was a risk of hydrazine contamination. We flew this a couple times. It gave negative results. That is, no hydrazine was brought in. Uh, we knew that there had to be some modifications to make it respond faster. We had changed the dopant in here, uh, but the estimate, I think, was something like a half a million dollars, and the program decided that they weren't going to pay that much for the modifications. So this never flew as actual flight hardware, but only as an experiment.
years of work with this gave us some wisdom about selecting a new combustion products analyzer, which we did not call a combustion products analyzer. Somewhat awkwardly, we called it the compound specific analyzer for combustion products so that it was not tarred with the reputation that this instrument got. I think undeservedly, we made mistakes in rushing it on, but this was a pretty good instrument. The one failing that we saw as chemists was that the hydrogen fluoride sensor never worked right. Hydrogen fluoride is important to monitor because it's a key product from wire insulation burning. We struggled to get a hydrogen fluoride sensor that would work, and we never did. We went to another instrument uh, shown here, a good bit smaller and much lighter, but there still is no hydrogen fluoride sensor available for these units. Instead, we replaced that sensor with an oxygen sensor. We felt that during a real fire, a big fire, there might be consumption of oxygen, and that would need to be followed uh, by the crew. So in this one, we've got a hydrogen compensated carbon monoxide sensor, a hydrogen cyanide sensor, and what we call a hydrogen chloride sensor, but it actually detects all acid gases, such as hydrogen bromide and hydrogen fluoride. So in a sense, we've got hydrogen fluoride covered indirectly. Like the CPA, these are electrochemical sensors. We learned some other features we wanted. One thing we wanted was a zero filter. This goes on a pump head. Let me show you what that looks like. This pump head fits right over the unit, which would come in like this, and actually pumps gases over these electrochemical sensors. And this particular picture shows the zero filter in place. The zero filter was necessary to make sure that as we uh, were looking at the atmosphere after a fire, we could actually zero this unit and be sure that the carbon monoxide sensor would re-zero properly. And uh, we build these and test these in our lab even now. The other issue with that device was how to get a sample from behind somewhere where there was a fire. This is a wand. We hook it to the pump, which hooks to this device. And using this uh, attachment, we can sample in behind panels and so on if that's where we think the fire is originating. To my knowledge, this has only been used once or twice. Uh, and it was shown that wherever the crew thought the carbon monoxide was coming from, it was not coming from there. One other issue with this analyzer was whether it ought to alarm, where it ought to alarm, and how. There's a caution and warning system <clears throat> in the space station. And we, wanted, we asked the question, OK, is this thing loud enough to be heard? Do we need to plumb it into caution and warning? Uh, one thing we've learned is if you're going to plumb something into a, a distributed system like caution and warning, you're going to pay a real price in dollars and in anguish getting it into that system. So if you can make a standalone analyzer, it's a good thing. Uh, by the way, this flies now on shuttle and station. Its alarm is not loud enough to be heard by the crew given the noise in the shuttle or station. We had thought about flying an alarm, en alarm enhancer. That's this thing, in case you want to. That is deemed loud enough to be heard on station should it go off. Uh, the powers that be decided in their wisdom that we really didn't need an alarm that loud with a little instrument like this, that the crew would actually be able to see the visual flashing, which these things do, when necessary. Uh, for some time, this was uh, actually on all the time as a first alert monitor. Now it is not. These are deployed around the station, and there are four of them. And uh, I think only one flies on shuttle now. For a while, we flew two of them. Uh, okay. That's combustion products analyzer. We are looking for improvements on this. Uh, it'll be hard to beat this. Electrochemical sensors are a little bit squirrely in a sense that they're not always specific for given compounds. And sometimes if you overdrive them with a huge dose of what they're measuring, uh, they misbehave. But right now, they're as good as there is out there. We knew that on space station, the crew would be there a long time. And we wanted to fly an analyzer for volatile organics. 
the program asked us if we wanted to fly as part of risk mitigation experiments on the shuttle, and we leapt at the opportunity, if you will. This is the volatile, volatile organics analyzer we eventually flew on station. We flew it twice on shuttle, STS-86 and STS-89. The first time it didn't work at all, and we ended up just bringing it back. The second time we had to do an in-flight maintenance of, I think, it was several hours. It was a complex process. We did learn from that that the crew, if properly instructed by very smart ground controllers, can uh, fix a really complex instrument. This thing has flown now for eight years on station and has performed well. Two lessons we learned here. One, this was a one-of-a-kind bill that cost several million dollars for each instrument. Very expensive, <clears throat> extremely complex. Safety required us to put a lot of fuses in here, and I'm not gonna attack their wisdom, but it tended to be the fuses that failed and not the instrument itself. Complexity is something to stay away from if you can. <clears throat> The other thing we learned is about crew time. This thing could be um, programmed from the ground and operate uh, independently of the crew, so we got a lot of samples. Other analyzers like this, for example, for water, had to be drug out, set up, and then operated over 45 minutes to an hour of crew time, and that never happened for some of those instruments. So minimize uh, crew time. Another thing to minimize <coughs> is um, how dependent your devices are on the resources of the parent vehicle. For example, the Volta organic analyzer was dependent on nitrogen from one of the uh, ECLIS systems to operate. Uh, and we were not aware that ECLIS, for example, was gonna periodically shut down the nitrogen system to purge it and so on, and they didn't know to tell us. And so we had some real hiccups for a, a few times when they uh, were maintaining their nitrogen system, and our instrument over here went crazy, wondering what happened to its nitrogen supply. <coughs> okay, one last instrument I'd like to show you is a carbon dioxide monitor. We were asked to put this instrument on by the environmental control and life support people because they felt that their whole module sensor on shuttle was not giving a true reading of the carbon dioxide that the crew was being exposed to. And so we got this handheld device, and actually in space, the crew member can actually hook it into a vest or something if you want to measure carbon dioxide, let's say, when they're exercising. And this was used to determine if there were pockets of carbon dioxide from human uh, metabolism and so on. It's built by the same company that builds ugly boxes for combustion products, as you can see. This is a very different technology, though. This is um, infrared spectrometry. This is an exceptionally good instrument. I could throw this across the room, pick it up, and it would still be calibrated. We brought these things back, and even four or five hundred days after they were calibrated, flown, and brought back, they still operate very well. The one thing uh, is needed is a, a little filter to remove um, water so that the uh, tiny infrared cell in here gives a it's not confused by the water being present. And this thing's fun to play with. Not only can you blow into it and make carbon dioxide uh, jack it up, this thing's kind of cute too. Okay. Now, you can cut that out if you want. Now I want to go on to non-hardware lessons. We've, I guess I might capture the hardware lessons here in summary just uh, briefly. Uh, don't let them push you to fly hardware before it's ready. Keep it simple. Don't depend on other people's systems to drive your hardware. And um, don't use crew time if you can help it. Make it small. Make it reliable. And don't overpromise. And they will always remember the failures. OK, non-hardware lessons. Going into shuttle uh, in the early 90s, we realized that a lot of chemicals were flying in the vehicle that the crew didn't know how to deal with if they were to escape, either from a system or from a payload. So we developed what we call the blue book. It was about this size. And for each mission, we'd make one of these like a pamphlet and give it to the BME so they could have it at the console then. 
And they could look up certain chemicals in there if they were to escape and determine how toxic they were and sort of figure out what to do. That evolved during the shuttle era into a hazard material summary database that's computerized, that's available to the crew uh, on shuttle and on station. It's available to the flight surgeons, the BMEs, and a number of other people that use it. And very quickly, if something leaks, uh, the crew or others can determine what it is that is leaking and what the hazard level is. And we are in the process of getting decals on all the pieces of hardware up there, at least on the US side of the, of the station and also on the shuttle, that indicate the crew's immediate uh, response if something is leaking. One thing we learned about building that database is that we always had to verify what we thought was going to fly with the PI that was going to fly it. We found, before we were doing a verification process, we found that the PI might change their mind right before flight and slip something in on us that was never intended to be part of that experiment or we didn't know about. So actually now what we've got is a two-tier verification process. When a principal investigator proposes to fly a payload with chemicals in it, uh, we ask them what group of chemicals they're going to fly and give us a list of their proposed chemicals, knowing that not all will fly. We do an assessment of those, and then when the experiment is packed for flight, that may be a few months before flight or it may be on the day of launch, we ask for verification of exactly what flew so that when the database is put together for the crew and for the flight surgeons and so on, it is a as accurate as we can possibly make it. We also learned during the shuttle era that we needed to be on call. And uh, since those days and always, there's been a NASA toxicologist on call. There's been a contractor mission specialist. That is a contractor toxicologist who knows the details of the experiments that are flying and knows about the toxic chemicals that are in there. And we also have a contractor hardware specialist always on call to deal with whichever one of these things might be flying. And, and those people are the people that calibrate the instruments in the lab. They know how they behave. They know their idiosyncrasies and so on. And they can be very valuable when, when an issue comes up on orbit. There were a number of ground-based issues that pertain to toxicology uh, during the early 1990s. One involved the application of dimethyl ethoxy silane to the uh, orbiter uh, thermal tiles that, that coat the underneath side of the, the orbiter. Uh, what was happening was some of the workers down at KSC were getting sick when they were injecting the tiles. And so there was a big angst over that, and the industrial hygienist down there called us and asked us to get involved. It turned out that no one had done a credible tox study on dimethyl ethoxy silane, so we proposed to do that to the shuttle program to the tune of about a million bucks. And after they swallowed a little bit, and, uh, and we assured them that that's the only way they were going to get a limit, uh, they came up with a million bucks for us. We contracted out a study and found that it was not that toxic, <clears throat> but that because of the monitoring of the humans uh, and so on at Kennedy Space Center and the frequency of the events, uh, there was a fairly low level set by the uh, American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. We actually went to that group and proposed a TLV for DMES and got it approved. Uh, and that has governed the operations at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, since. There was another issue uh, in the late 80s involving the toxicity of Halon 1301. That's the fire extinguisher that's used in the shuttle even now. The question was if inadvertently a fire extinguisher were, were released on shuttle, how soon would the crew have to come back? Because we knew that uh, this fire extinguisher was not scrubbed well. And the answer was we don't know because we don't know how toxic it is to humans. So there's actually a human experiment done in the late 80s uh, where humans were exposed, I think it was eight humans, for 24 hours to this material. And it was very clear that uh, Halon 1301 was a good choice from the point of view of it not being toxic to humans at reasonable levels. And so the flight rules were modified to reduce the risk of going to a primary landing site or an emergency landing site. Both of those uh, events, to my knowledge, have never taken place, but I'm told they're very risky. And, and you don't want to go to those unless you really have to. And so we had a really good flight rule uh, for halon discharge if it were to occur. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that 
over the years of shuttle, let's say from about 1990 until 2008, we've worked with the National Research Council Committee on Toxicology to get improved limits uh, for the shuttle and for space station. Before this, an individual in our group was setting limits, and while I, I have no doubt that he did a good, incredible job, the pedigree of those limits was not very clear. So we really wanted to get the endorsement of an outside group uh, that involved cognizant experts. And so uh, in front of a panel of about 12 to 15 expert toxicologists, we developed our limits, and they're published in a series of volumes. The air limits look like this, and the, and the water limits are in, in a different colored booklet. But uh, these are all fully documented and approved by the uh, National Research Council Committee on Toxicology and published by the Academy of Sciences. And that has proven to be a, a worthwhile thing to do, while not cheap and not without its uh, required effort. Uh, there was a need to stand up, so to speak, to some Russian limits that were a bit irrational in our opinion. And because of the pedigree of our limits, we were at least able to get them in the requirements for a space station. Uh, and we hope to return to that effort uh, in a few years. Um, so in summary, uh, there's a lot of things to pay attention to uh, in terms of toxicology in the shuttle era. Uh, you need to be available if you're a toxicologist to support the people on flight uh, when an emergency comes up. There needs to be a tier system <coughs> where if I'm called, I can call somebody that really knows about hardware, which I don't. Uh, if you're going to set limits for people living in space vehicles, you must do it in a very uh, competent way and in a way that others can understand that um, these are good limits and not just something you cooked up in a few minutes on your desk. And I'll leave it at that. Questions? I've been asked uh, to talk a little bit about how toxicology came to matter for the space program. From the very earliest days, that would be the early 60s, when we decided we were going to put humans in space, there was a lot of concern about off-gassing of materials that would go into the capsule. And there are old memos um, from 64, 65, where there were a lot of questions and concerns about the off-gassing of hardware. And NASA actually engaged the National Academy of Sciences in those days to set limits for the compounds that we thought might come off of uh, materials that would off-gas. Sampling in those days consisted of this, taking the charcoal filters that were used to clean the air during the Mercury or Gemini flight and bring them back to the lab actually where it is now and analyze uh, the uh, charcoal, uh, desorb the material off of there and analyze the charcoal to get an idea of what was at one time in the air and had been removed. Uh, there are some old reports that show a list of probably a hundred compounds with a table that shows yes they were there or no they weren't, but no quantification. The limits that were given to us by the Academy of Sciences in those days were pick a number. Uh, they were based on very little documentation and uh, were more or less promulgated by the fact that they were set by a presumably credible body and that that body didn't have to subject itself to uh, documentation of how they actually set the limits. I believe it was by the early 70s, we were actually beginning to think about going to Mars and some of those limits were extended out to a thousand days. Sampling evolved to the point where some solid sorbent samplers were used in a crude form on Skylab, I believe. There was a mass spectrometer on Skylab, but it was not designed to quantify air quality. And then the shuttle came along, and, and that's when uh, we got perhaps more serious about monitoring uh, air quality. The drivers of that were, first of all, there were small burn incidents. I believe it was STS-6. Uh, some of the electronics that were driving the humidification system or the de dehumidifier uh, pyrolyzed. And uh, if you can imagine being in a small space with something burning and have no way out, that's really not where you want to be. And then there were other events. Uh, the teleprinter cable burned. There were two burns of the data display unit. Uh, 
on STS-35, and it was actually uh, strong enough in smell that it woke up the crew. Uh, and, and that uh, drives a lot of need for combustion product monitoring. We saw a lot of volatile organics uh, in the air of shuttle. And uh, it was clear that if we were going to fly vehicles for a long, long time, for example, a space station or something, that monitoring the volatile organics would be important. Now, where do these things come from? They come from off-gassing, as I said, and that can be controlled. They come from payloads that leak. They come from utility chemicals that are used, anywhere from deodorants, uh, hair processing, processing materials, body washes, uh, soldering experiments, there are just any number of sources. And there are things we see in the air, the origin of which we simply don't know. Occasionally we see a, a spike of ethanol, and, and the source of that can be speculated on. But, but the space station air is uh, quite a, uh, a Pandora's box of, of chemical pollution, um, usually at very low levels. We also wanted to deal with incidences where things that weren't exactly a pyrolysis product escaped. That's why we've gone to volatile organic analyzers to um, characterize the air in situations like that. What we've actually seen with a, a modern analyzer that I don't have here is that we can actually follow the opening of a new module. Now these tend to have a buildup of pollutants because they don't have an air cleaner in them. So when the hatch is open on station uh, so that the crew can enter these modules that may have been sealed up for 30 days or 45 days, there's a lot of pollution in there, and we can actually see that pollution come across station and reach our analyzers that are typically in the lab and, and, and increase the values there. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the story of where the pollutants come from and why we monitor them. Uh, clearly, if we're going to go to a distant destination for a year and a half, we're going to have to have very small, reliable analyzers uh, that don't require a lot of crew time to uh, manipulate. Next question, so, sir. So why don't you just use the same kind of analyzers on orbit that we use on the ground? What well, okay. Let's take an example. The instrument we use to analyze these things with covers a desktop. And we have four instruments in my lab. And a good day, a good day is when two of those are working very well. Uh, GC mass spectrometers tend to be very fickle. They're very complex. Uh, so you need to fly something else. And I won't elaborate on that. Uh, there are simpler concept, conceptually simpler analyzers that are perhaps not as powerful as a GC mass spec. Right now we're flying a, 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 a differential mobility spectrometer. And I won't go into what that is, but it's a rather robust detector to put behind a gas chromatograph. And that instrument has proven very uh, effective on station. It doesn't have the analytical power of a mass spectrometer. I would never say that. But it is much smaller and it's much more reliable. We, we can bet on it being operating six months or a year from when we fly it. Whereas mass spectrometers tend to be very fragile. Uh, instruments to fly should draw very little power. Um, that's for obvious reasons. You only have so much power in any vehicle, and it gets distributed and shared, and, and you only get your, your portion of it. And as I said earlier, you want to be independent of any resources. Um, for example, the mass spectrometer that's being flown now has to have helium as a carrier gas, and they have to bring their own gas. Uh, we, uh, we got burned with the VOA because we depended on space station nitrogen. And uh, that was not a reliable source all the time. Uh, so I think that's a reasonably long answer to your question. So and then how has the role of the toxicologist changed from the early days of space flight through the shuttle here in terms of okay. what your role is and how you interact with flight directors and flight surgeons? I, I have some knowledge of what toxicology was like, let's say, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, a man named Elliot Harris was actually chief for some time. This would have been in the late Apollo era, lead up to shuttle. He was uh, branch chief of the toxicology branch uh, at Johnson Space Center. 
for reasons I don't know, uh, he left, and the toxicology branch disappeared and became a group. Uh, in those days, their main task was not to set limits in a lot of the things we do. It was to deal with off-gassing issues and, and a number of other issues that, that had to do with developing a space vehicle like the shuttle. That kind of involvement has, has kind of taken two directions. One direction is toward developing really credible ironclad limits that, that have a really strong pedigree and aren't set by an individual. The other is to more involvement on a real-time basis with the missions. Uh, that really makes it fun to be a toxicologist here. Uh, right now, we're probably working three or four uh, relatively important issues related to space station right now. Uh, and we get called into meetings and, and our expertise gets um, dissected and, and, and we have to communicate to engineers uh, what often is rather fuzzy and uncertain data in a way that they, they believe it. Uh, one incident that comes to mind is when this little motor burned up on STS-40. As I said before, it was in the orbiter refrigerator freezer. We really were way off track during flight as to what caused that. The crew said this thing reeked and we can't stand it. Eventually, we gave the crew permission to turn the thing off and put duct tape over all the openings, and that began to control the odor a little bit. We thought at the time it might have been off-gassing, so to speak, from urine that was spilled inside the refrigerator. Uh, when we got the unit back and examined it, it was clear that we were way off base, that it was actually a pyrolysis event. The motor had burned up. During the mission, uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Chewing Lam, and I were called in to deal with this issue. And I can remember it was a Saturday. And for whatever reason, we both had charge of our little kids. I don't remember where our wives were. But we drug our little kids in here. And so there were four bored little kids while we sat and tried to deliberate with the other people about what was going on with the orbiter refrigerator freezer. But it was fun, and I don't suppose it killed the kids. Uh, but as I said, we were, at the time, because we didn't have the tools we needed, we were far off base in terms of understanding what happened. So uh, tell us, uh, when you think back over the years and your shuttle experiences, tell us another shuttle story. <laughs> uh, what, what might be your most memorable shuttle memory with regard to toxicology? <laughs> Well, I guess that can be good or bad. Um, I remember when we had gotten the CPA modified so that we thought it wasn't sensitive to hydrogen. And then we had the problem with the data display units burning. And I was called over to mission control to help sort out things. And the flight surgeon was John Schultz. And Sam Poole was the division chief. And, and Sam didn't bide fools. And so we were over there and we were going over whether the increased carbon monoxide readings were true. And they were high enough that if they were true, it might affect crew performance, including the pilot who was going to have to land the shuttle. And there was a lot of debate going back and forth about the levels of carbon monoxide, the capabilities of the pilot, should he be on his advisor, and so on and so on. How long would it take to wash the carbon monoxide out if it were in there? Uh, eventually, I, I was really impressed with Sam. Uh, he, he listened to me, listened to the surgeons, and he listened to the other people, and he decided we were not going to trust the instrument. We were going to go and land as we were going to land in the first place, and we did. Uh, and he was right. Uh, the message there, I think, is you get all the information you have and you make your best decision. All the information may not be very uh, good, but when it's the best you're going to get, you've got to go with it. And, and he made a good call in that case. And we learned that you don't fly it until it's ready to fly. Um, a lot of really great things have happened in, in the toxicology group in the 21 years I've been associated with it. I'm impressed 
in many ways, but let me highlight at least two of them. One is the, the ability of, of the chemists uh, and, and the contractor team to not only analyze samples and devise clever sampling uh, techniques, but also to identify and very carefully scrutinize instruments that we might fly on board, either the shuttle or the space station. Uh, it takes a, a sense of vision and intelligence and a knowledge that's, that's rare in many places. Uh, it has not been rare in my group, and, and my good fortune to work with that group has been, in many cases, because of, of those excellent analytical chemists that, that uh, stay abreast of current technology and know how to adapt something for space flight. The other thing I want to highlight is the expertise that resides in the toxicologists that work at Johnson Space Center. This would be on both sides, the contractor and the, uh, the NASA side. Um, probably one of the hardest things to do is to stand up in front of a panel of experts, perhaps a dozen or so, selected by the National Research Council to scrutinize what you're going to tell them the limit ought to be for benzene or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide for that matter. Survey the literature and defend what you've concluded. And I can tell you that over the years I've gotten a lot of respect for my colleagues for being willing to do that, uh, to not be battered down, if you will, by multiple spears that come from experts. Uh, and, to, and to weather the storm and come out on the other end and have limits that, uh, that I think we can be uh, fully proud of. And those limits have been developed for air and water both. Uh, we've made some great relationships with, with really world-class toxicologists because of this involvement. Um, but I've also gained a, a hearty respect for the ability of my colleagues to go do this. In terms of mission support, it's probably declined a little bit over the past few years. We've actually tried to put more tools in the hands of the BME insurgent than we had, let's say, in the 90s with the shuttle program. And that's worked OK. But every once in a while, we catch the BMEs uh, maybe making a decision that they should have called us about. Uh, but we work that as, as the case by case goes. So it's, re it's really been an honor to work with these people. You're gonna pick my whole brain. Uh, you're gonna you go, you gonna fire me or something? You, you know everything I know pretty soon, and then you won't even meet me. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, the vision of where we're going is not exactly focused, but if we are to go to either a near Earth object or another distant object let's say Mars, or even a moon of Mars. But we're going to have to deal with the environment there. And that's something unique that we haven't had to deal with in toxicology, because the, we bring the pollutants with us in these vehicles. But when we get to the surface of, the Mar of Mars, or the moon, or an asteroid, we're going to encounter dust of a very uh, unusual nature there. And we're going to have to understand how that dust affects not only human health, because invariably some of it's going to get back in the habitat but also how it affects hardware. That's one of the challenges. If you're going to go even to the moon and stay a while, you're going to have in situ analytical capabilities. You're not going to be bringing samples like this back. It isn't going to happen. You're not going to bring back formaldehyde badges. You're going to have to have a way to do that where the habitat is and where the crew is living. And that is going to be a real challenge, making exceptionally good, reliable, low-powered, analytical instruments that will withstand a mission of two or three years is not easy. Nobody does that yet. Nobody. Uh, I think in the next five to ten years we will be able to do that with, with a lot of confidence. Miniaturization is happening all the time with analytical instruments. Um, and there are some promising devices out there that, that have a lot of capability. The other thing we have to work on is how the data are presented to the crew. 
they're not going to go around reading spectrograms or complex panels and tables of data. We're going to have to present this to them in a very uh, straightforward way. And, and one thing I've imagined, and I think we could do it, is, is to present the crew, let's say, data on volatile organics that would say, okay, here's the risk that you might have eye and nose irritation because of the pollutants we see in the air. And that risk is below some threshold or above. Or, or here's the risk that you might uh, have too many uh, central nervous system depressants, like alcohols and so on, in the air. If you're experiencing some of these symptoms, you might want to look at your analyzer and see if it's telling you that there's too many of these compounds in the air. But it needs to be presented in a very simple way that the crew can understand and use to diagnose what's going on in the vehicle. And so there are plenty of challenges um, in terms of setting limits. Uh, there's so many toxicologists around you could argue that they're constantly devising new ways to set presumably better limits and of course new data are coming along all the time uh, with the compounds that we're interested in. So probably every <coughs> five to ten years we need to revisit the limits we've got already and see if they need to be refined. And, and in fact, I'm planning in 2012 to restart the effort that we stopped a few years ago with the National Research Council, although we may use a different body. But limits have to be kept up to date. Limits that are 10 years old or, or too old. There's too many things changing. So it's what's going to go away is, is archival sampling. You know, one day we're going to be on the moon or we're going to be on an asteroid somewhere. In, in, there's not going to be huge GC mass spectrometers back in the lab to do samples. We won't be doing it that way. And I would guess that will probably end when ISS ends, which is either 2020 or 2028, if we can keep it functioning that long. So there's the vision. So what, what are some of the promising technologies you think <laughs> out there that might okay. have a place There's, some of my colleagues would argue that there are optical techniques that will do a better job of monitoring combustion products than electrochemical sensors. And as I said, electrochemical sensors have their idiosyncrasies, and sometimes it even matters who's building them back at the company. If there, there, there's a bit of what I've called witchcraft to building those things, and if, if the, the craftsman changes, uh, the sensors change. Uh, Optical techniques are a little more robust. Unfortunately, the optical monitors I've seen are about four or five times as big as this to do one or two compounds. That's going to be too big. They're going to have to shrink. Uh, that's for combustion products. We are going to have a panel in a few months to go over all the technologies with outside experts and see what we've missed and see what's most promising. In terms of volatile organics, we do fly a gas chromatograph a differential mobility spectrometer that I think shows a lot of promise. It could be miniaturized even further. I've seen a handheld instrument. Well, the one we fly now is maybe about as big as this thing, or going to fly as government furnished equipment. It's going to have a little screen on it, and that will communicate to the crew if any of the pollutants are out of line and so on. But I've seen one that the company is building that's a fifth, maybe an eighth that size really handheld vault to organics analyzer. Uh, will these be reliable enough? I don't know. Experience will tell us. GC mass spectrometry, very powerful technique, although the thing people forget is that it's sometimes blind to important compounds. Uh, GC mass spectrometers are, are not the see-all and end-all of everything. They are complex. They are fickle. And they can be a challenge, I think, to, to make in a reliable and dependable way. There are other techniques that might be useful. Some people have built a membrane inlet mass spectrometer. Now, these mass spectrometers tend to be simpler than the more complex ones that are behind a, a gas chromatograph column. And they show some promise. The, the, the issue is what the membrane will let in and what it won't, and what happens to the membrane if it gets a high dose of some compound. It can actually ruin the membrane. 
and then the mass spectrometer fails because it gets overdosed on uh, a compound that uh, was not uh, meant for that. There is an optical technique called Fourier transform infrared spectrometry that has been used by the Europeans uh, to fly a rather large instrument on station. It gets the spectrum of everything in the air that exhibits an FTIR spectrum and then deconvolutes those. I think it was moderately successful when it flew on station. Uh, there were some surprises to the group, but they were able to ferret out those surprises and figure out, for example, that one of the compounds they were seeing was uh, a compound that leaks from the Russian uh, service module air conditioning system. Uh, I, I suppose you could argue there's a bit of witchcraft there. To my knowledge, there's maybe one or two individuals in the world that can deconvolute these spectra and make sense of them. Uh, that's not good. Uh, that, in fact, that's always uh, an issue with ground-based or instruments that are going to fly on in near-Earth near orbit. Do you have the people on the ground to sustain the, those instruments and deal with whatever analysis they produce? And, and that can be a question uh, if you have a company build it. If the company fails, you're sunk. If you have an exotic team at some high-level lab build it, is that team going to exist three years from now when your instrument's are giving, uh, giving you fits? Uh, there are a lot of questions with how to sustain these things. So uh, anyway, that's kind of a, a toxicologist survey of techniques. 